let's take a look at Coulomb's Law, Vectors, Angles, and Direction. First and foremost, let's get our directions straight. Negative is not a direction. Let's use regular directions like left and right so we know which way things are actually going to go. We'll take a look at the equilibrium problem first. See this 5 millicoulomb charge? Well, if we let it go, it's going to go scooting off to the right. Where should we put a positive charge of another 1 millicoulomb to bring it back, to keep it where it is and keep it at equilibrium? Answer is straight, quite straightforward. Put another charge that's totally the same in every way on the opposite side. This one will push uh, left, this one will push right, and between the two of them, the 5 will stay exactly where it is. What if it were a negative charge? This 1 is going to push the 5 to the right. Where would we put a negative charge to pull the 5 to the left? Answer. Not on this side. This side, it would pull even more to the right. We would have to put the negative charge over here. Same charge, same distance, but basically have to put the two charges right on top of each other. And as anybody knows, positive plus negative, they're going to charge each other by conduction. The whole thing will be neutral, and hey, the center charge will be equilibrium. Problem solved. Let's make it more interesting. One millicoulomb charges don't come in little shakers from the chem lab. What if this is the real world and the charges are different sizes? Now, here's our equilibrium problem. We're going to do this with a scale up and a scale down. One of the charges is a certain number of times bigger than the other. In this case, four times bigger. Now, we'll do the problem the official way, not by the sit and stare. First and foremost, before you do anything else, take the diagram that you've copied down and put a big star on the charge you're working on. This is not optional. I want to see that asterisk in a gray pencil on white paper. The question is, what do we do to bring the center charge to equilibrium? We are working on the center charge. Got that star drawn? No, you don't. I see you. You're not taking me seriously. Draw that star. Now, decide which way this charge over here is going to move based on the charge of our, on the left, which is our problem charge. Put your pencil on the star and see which way the center charge is going to move. This charge is going to push the middle one to the right. Yeah, I know it's on the left, and I know this one's going to move down to the left, but we're not working on that one. We're working on the center charge. That's why you have the star. The center charge is going to move to the right. Keep that in mind. Now, we're going to put this 4 down, and that's going to push left. But if we put it over here, it'll push 4 times harder. 4 forces minus 1 force is going to make a net force of 3 forces. And this charge isn't going to be in equilibrium. It's going to rocket off to the left and hit the 1 over here and make a dinging sound. We need to move this 4 where? Further in? Further out? Well, if we move it further in, inverse square law says the force will get stronger. We want to move it further out so the force will get weaker. How far out? Think. You don't need to write it down, just make a hypothesis. Do you think a force four times stronger should be moved four times further out? Yes? No? Can you justify? Well, here's the way we're going to prove it. Find the force on the left, find the force on the right, set them equal, solve. We could do this in numbers. We have 1 times 10 to the negative third coulomb and 1.2 meters, and it's already in meters. We don't have to convert. But why bother with the numbers when you can get the same answer so much faster and neater with letters? We have Q1, that's the one in the middle. We have Q2, that's the business charge. And we have R, they're a distance apart. Now, on the other side, we've got the same Q1 in the middle. This Q2 is four times our original Q2. And how far are they? Uh, I don't know, center mass to center mass, no clue, call it X. Now, set them equal and solve. Notice that you saved a lot of time not having to type in Coulomb's constant to your calculator. The K's cross out, center charge crosses out, hey, even the one millicoulomb crosses out, cross it all out, and solve for X. When you're done and you know how far out to put the new charge, press play to check your work. Now, pause and finish the algebra. Ready? Everything cancels out. Get a nice little cross-solve here, formerly known as cross-multiplying, but it's not really multiplying, it's solving. There we go. Four times further out, right? Wrong. Square root, square root, twice as far out. Inverse square law. This is the square part of the inverse square law. If your charge is four times stronger, you only need twice as much distance to make up for it. Hey, twice 1.2 meters? I can do that. Put the new one 2.4 meters away. 
All Coulomb's Law questions are variants of these two. Question number one, we just tried. We don't want it to move. What should we build? Question number two, we want it to move, or possibly it's going to move whether we want it or not. Which way, how fast, and where should we stand if we want to see it going by? Let's try a two-dimensional problem of something that's going to move. Let's find the net force and make sure we have our vector directions straight. Vector means brackets and commas. We might as well switch to them immediately and save us a lot of square roots. We want the total force. We want the net force on the top left charge. That's the one here. That is the 12 first and foremost. Put a star on it, a nice big one. You're going to need it. I guarantee that if you don't draw this star sooner or later, you're going to get one of the directions 180 degrees backwards just by sheer enthusiastic reading. Got your star? Ready? Good. First and foremost, the first step is to deal with directions. Do not reach for your calculator. Do not start typing in 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. Directions first. Paper, pencil, eyes, nothing else. Let's give these charges names so we know which one's which. We're working on charge A. You can also call it charge L, but let's just go with charge A. We want the direction that charge B B will pull charge A. Put your pencil on charge A. Looking only at charge A, which way will it move relative to B if B is stapled down and A is allowed to move? Draw in the arrow, starting from the star, and put your pencil down. Press play to check your work. Ready? Charge A is going to move toward charge B to the right. If you said charge B is going to move to the left, you're not answering the total force on charge A. That's why we have the star. Put your pencil on the star, always start there. Ready for the next one? Now do charge C. Put your pencil right back on the star. Keep it on the star. Look at charge C. Notice they're both positive charges and draw the way that charge A will move. Press play to check your work. Ready? Oh, 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 it's not going to move towards charge C. It's going to move away from charge C, and away from charge C is not the hypotenuse to this right triangle. It's up here. Draw your arrow up here if you didn't the first time. This cannot look like it is going southeast because it's not going southeast. In fact, it's going northwest. The only one that's going to move this away is going to be the 5, and we weren't asking about the 5. We were asking about the 12. Make sure you've got all your directions first before you worry about the formula. The directions, in many ways, are the easy part. After you've got the directions clear, then deal with the numbers. Negative is a direction. It means left, it means down. If you are have already dealt with the directions, you may ignore all the negative numbers. You've already dealt with them and you dealt with them first. Some books say take the absolute value of your formula, but that just makes people run screaming. Don't be intimidated. Just leave out the negatives. If you've dealt with the directions first, you're done. A, B, what's the force between them? Bust out your Coulomb's Law and proofread. Check your K. Check your first charge. Nano is negative ninth. If you'd forgot that since first semester, memorize it now. Notice we dropped the negative because the negative is direction and direction is already taken care of. Distance between them, center to center, 20 centimeters. Oh, can't use that because that's not in meters. Convert to meters. If you've forgotten how to convert centimeters to meters, I know what you'll be studying tonight. So far, so good. Type, 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 enter. Press play to check your work. Then incorporate vector direction. Once you've got your number, incorporate vector direction. Are you ready? Got your number and the brackets and the commas to make it look like this over here. You should be getting 2.7 micronewtons to the right, and to the right looks like this, positive x, 0 y. Now do the same thing for charge C. Very, very, very carefully plug in your Coulomb's constant, your first charge, your second charge, very, very carefully with pencils and drawings and possibly a little bit of math, find the distance between them, make sure it's in the right unit, and plug that in too. Make sure your number has a direction with it and press play to check your work. Ready? Got all your charges? 
got the distance between them. That's right. B to C is 20 centimeters, but A to C is not. This is a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. You have to draw that in. You have to find that hypotenuse. It's 20 centimeters rad 2, which is about 0.283 and some change meters. you got to find it. Then you got to work on direction. Up and left is the direction. If you can look at this by sight and see that that is a 135 degree angle, you are in great shape. If you can't, this is how we figure it out, and now we'll know for the next time that we'll need to do this first back up here when we deal with directions. Up and left is better than quote unquote negative or positive, but it's not quite specific enough for us to take components. We're going to have our force cosine theta and our force sine theta, assuming that we measure theta as we always do from the positive x-axis. What does that look like? After you've drawn your star, draw a coordinate axis here. This direction, FBA, is very clearly zero degrees. We can do that in our heads, right, not left, not up, not down. This, on the other hand, is an angle. We need to find that angle. The problem gives us this angle. These charges are evenly spaced. That means this angle is 45 degrees. Hey, that means this angle is also 45 degrees, and thank you freshman geometry, that means this angle is also 45 degrees, so 90 plus 45, 135. We'll know for next time that if we have anything that's not absolutely straight across or straight up and down, we'll draw coordinate axes, mark out all the angles, until we've got a nice angle here measured from the positive x-axis to label, shove into our calculator, and get some official numbers. Now, we're almost done. We wanted to find the net force. Well, we got a force from part charge B. We got a force from charge C. Now, we'll add them up. It's not so bad when they're in component form. Add them up. Get a net force. This is a net force. It's measured in newtons, and you can't see the newtons over here at the end of the screen. Now, we check the direction to make sure that everything is as it should be. This appears to be going left and up. Well, we had one force that was to the right adding to another force that was to the left and up. That was bigger and stronger. Why? Because the charge was bigger and stronger, even though it was a little bit further away. It wasn't that much further away. So going left and up away from the 5 charge is quite sensible. It's just not going quite as far left as it would have been because of the nice attractive force on the right. If it just said find the net force, you're done! If it asked for something pesky like the magnitude of the force, because you needed it to find a force field or find an acceleration, then quick review of vectors for how to find the magnitude. This is the magnitude. It's the length of the diagonal when you draw it. It's made of two x and y components. Hey, we just found the x and y components, and so we can put them into the Pythagorean theorem to make a nice right triangle. There's our x component. There's our y component. There's our Pythagorean theorem. Crunch those numbers into the calculator. Plus, pray when you're ready to check your work, you should get a nice net force of 5.19 times 10 to the negative 6th newtons. I just didn't write times 10 to the negative 6th. Now, direction. There's a right triangle. Left or right, it's all the same. If you're measuring your angle from the positive x-axis, that means y over x, opposite over adjacent. That means your angle that you're looking for is the arc tangent of your y component, which you have, over your x component, which you have, as long as you check the quadrant. We are expecting the second quadrant. We are expecting northwest. The calculator will not give us northwest. Be warned. Crunch those numbers in your calculator. Press enter. Press play to check your work. You should be getting negative 67 degrees, and that's just peachy, but negative 67 degrees is over here. It is precisely the direction that we said we're not going, and you've labeled it in your own nice gray pencil over here. You said we are not going negative 67 degrees, and you said it first. You said it even before you had any numbers at all. This is one of those cases where you have to add 180 degrees to the answer on your calculator because your calculator, poor love, can't tell the difference between this way and that way. And we know we're on the left side of the graph. We know we are at 113 degrees rather than negative 67. All done.